So we're continuing on to the preach. We're continuing our series on hope and adversity. So if you don't know me, my name is Paul. I lead the team uh, here at that Overseas New Life Community Church, and it's great to have you here with us. So if this is something of a new experience for you being here, I just want you to know that God knows your name. He's got a purpose for you, a plan for you. Don't underestimate the significance of you being here. If you have your Bibles, then you turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to be looking at verses 22 to 25. So it's 1 Peter chapter 1, near the end of your Bible, verses 22 to 25. If you don't have your Bibles, don't worry, the text will reliably come on the screen. Uh, but also, if you don't have a Bible, we don't want you to be without. So we have Bibles that are here for free for you to take home. So just grab me again for something like that after church and we'll make sure that we get you one. Okay, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 to 25. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. Okay, so we are continuing to really look at this section of Peter's letter that relates to the holiness and holy conduct of God's people. And in this particular collection of verses, we find that holy conduct, our behaviour, our attitude is sandwiched between the action that we have taken to follow Jesus, verse 22 says, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, and the action that God takes in causing us to be, in verse 23, born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable. So what these verses do, they outline this clear difference between how God is able to operate in comparison to mankind. What God does in who he is and how he operates, his promises, his workmanship, it has a forever quality about it. It is forever enduring. Chapter one of Peter's letter is really anchored in us as God's people setting our sights on that which God has established, the eternal workmanship, what God has prepared for those who love him, that by setting our sights, on the hope that is to come, we would have hope now, even in times of adversity. So in comparison to God, mankind is limited. Limited by time. You and I, our bodies, if you haven't guessed already, we have an expiry date. And there might be like a glory about the workmanship, the quality of what mankind can offer what we bring to the table. We can marvel, and we did when we went to Blenheim Palace, we marveled at many things that mankind has accomplished or engineered, but in time, it's destined to wither and fall. There is nothing permanent that mankind can offer. The glory will fade without God. No legacy will endure. Material riches and wealth may be accumulated, but then they'll be gone. Everything we bring is but a temporary offering, like a breath. Here one moment, gone the next. It's all very sobering stuff. Peter is saying that in these verses that we've just read is in tying ourselves to that which is enduring, to that which never fades, to who God is, to how he operates, that in doing so, that should impact our perspective on life. In particular, our treatment towards one another. As a people who share an inheritance, as ones who have taken hold of and clinged to this good news, we should, as it says in verse 22, love one another 
earnestly from a pure heart. So we are going to spend a little bit of time looking at loving one another as the family of God and finish by looking at some of the richness of Peter's language regarding the word of God. And I'm hoping by doing so should bring us back to nicely back to a place of worship and thanksgiving for uh, God and all that he is. And don't forget, you know, we're just opening that time during that time of worship. We're expecting, we're expecting about being as the people of God in the presence of God and seeing God move. So as God deposits things on your heart through the word and in response to the word, worship is a great opportunity to bring that offering, that prophetic encouragement, words of affirmation, testimonies of what God has done during that time. So be expectant even now that God is just going to deposit something in your heart to bring. Okay, subtitle, loving one another as family. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. The word earnestly means to love deeply. It means to love sincerely and to do so seriously. That that doesn't mean showing affection with a serious face. It it means take the the loving of the family of God seriously. If anything, I think, you know, these last you know, previous 18 months have shown us is how much we value being together as family, amen? In one sense, that, that feeling has been shared across the nation as many families have been unable to connect with one another. However, in addition, you know, we, we of course, we are no ordinary family. Uh, anyone who comes in will see that anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> our unity is tied together by the shared hope we have in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Yeah. It is because of him that we long to spend time together. More than that, to bring our offerings of worship to the one who has rescued and redeemed us. It is in him that we have hope now and hope for future. And it is our perspective on that future inheritance that we all have and share in Christ that enables us to love one another with a pure heart. Okay, so that does sound good, doesn't it? Okay, love one another deeply, sincerely, and seriously as a family who share hope hope and future in Christ. Now, theologically, that does sound like a lovely approach uh, to family, and theoretically, it actually works. However, if we were perfect in doing this, Peter would have no need to mention this in the first place. And as a church family who know that we are, we're not perfect, even in aspiring to love one another deeply, sincerely sincerely and seriously from a pure heart, we know as a family we're not going to hit that note every time. And so what we're going to do is we're going to label this as normal family life. Every family, as you know, has its tensions. Every family has its squabbles and its falling out. We have, I wasn't just directly looking at my family then when I was just saying that. Uh, We have differences, differences in cultures, differences in age, differences in ethnicity, in experience, in gender, in careers and skill sets, in personalities and opinions, in models of parenting, food interests, health interests, hobby interests. The list is pretty big. We'd have to have something pretty big to unite us all. And we are united by something pretty big, someone pretty big. Now, in all seriousness, I think... uh, you guys do a, a pretty marvellous job as lo- at loving one another as family. You do. But I do want us to acknowledge that sometimes we're not going to always hit the same note. And actually, if you've heard us sing in worship, you realise that we don't all hit the same note. <clears throat> That's why we drive the speakers loud, guys, okay? <clears throat> Real, authentic Family life means that tensions will happen, differences will occur. And I think that's a really good thing for anyone who is looking in on us or looking upon us as a church family. They will know 
that this family isn't perfect, but hopefully what they will see or experience is an imperfect family growing in our journey with Jesus. Amen? Amen. However, with that in mind, we're not just going to be a family that settles just for that. Because we are on a, we are a family on a mission together. We're a family to see many people's lives transformed by Jesus. To be a church that pioneers and establishes new communities of believers. To provide love and support for those who struggle with life's challenges. Part of our transformation as a church family is our aspiration. Aspiration to be a family that with shared hope in Jesus, with a pure heart, which includes pure motive, we are a family genuinely seeking to love one another deeply, sincerely, and seriously. God has set us apart to be holy as he is holy. That is a work of God that makes us completely unique to any other family model. It is because of this work of God in us that moves us to be holy in our conduct, holy in our behaviour, and we can demonstrate the love that Peter calls the church to show through our holy conduct toward one another. My encouragement to you is to remind one another of the type of love we are to have and be quick and sincere in demonstrating this to each other. Be invested in spurring one another on in the Lord. Be quick to apologise. Be quick to forgive sincerely. Be just as quick to encourage, to build and strengthen one another and be willing to go the extra mile for one another. The type of leadership that Jesus models is one of service. Lead by serving. serve one another now i'm talking metaphorically here okay but it's worth asking the question to yourself okay would i be willing to wash my brother or sister's feet oh look at that my wife hates feet so i know it literally make her physically ill just thinking about this okay but this is the type of image (laughs) The type of serving Jesus models to his followers so that they may do the same. If you can't say yes to this metaphorical question, firstly, good for you for being honest, but then take the opportunity to come before God and say, help me to be more like you. That I may love my church family as you would have me love them, deeply Sincerely, seriously. Washing one another's feet is an example of the willingness of the church family to love and tend and care for one another, even if it means pausing your activity to help someone be prepared for theirs. It is a hospitality that goes beyond just opening the door. It's about going the extra mile for one another and not begrudgingly, but with a love that is deep, sincere and serious. Okay. Let's stop there on holy conduct as family and finish by looking at Peter's final few words in this section. Next subtitle is the living and abiding word of God. Okay, so in verses 20, if you still got your finger in, your, in the Bible, in verses 23 to 25, I believe Peter is being quite intentional about some of the language he is using regarding the word. Okay, so the word in this section is used three times. And whilst there is an ap- a clear application for this section, the one that we've just covered, that's the application, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Part of the reason for that application is wrapped up in what is for Peter an a-, a natural understanding of the word. But what might be for us something we might skirt over with a surface reading of the text. Right, okay, so... This is, however, you, you guys might be already all over this, okay? So when I unpack what I believe Peter is talking about regarding the word, I might just be reiterating something you guys already know. And so feel free to pretend that this is completely fresh revelation for you, okay? <clears throat> okay, so the last sentence of that passage is, and this word is the good news that was preached to you. 
Now, naturally, I would assume on a surface reading that this word was the proclamation, the verbal sharing of the hope in Jesus Christ for every man, woman and child who, pro- who would profess their need for him, their willingness to trust him, knowing that in exchange, Jesus would pave the way for new life in him, a new beginning, a fresh start with God. And of course, there's lots of bonuses that come with that. But at its heart, it's the death and resurrection of Jesus that paves the way for everyone who believes in him to be made right with God that might be the very reason why you're here this morning to get right with God and it simply starts by you putting your trust in Jesus and confessing your need for him in your life so this word could simply mean verbal communication of this good news and whilst there is some truth in that when Peter's writing I don't think it's primarily the message he has in mind this word could also be a reference to the written word of God. This is the scripture, the Bible, what we have in our hands. And the letter of Hebrews helps us to understand that the Bible is not just a collection of writings for our reference, but significantly, in addition, it is our life. Hebrews 4.12 For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Meaning these words have the power to jump off the page, get right into the centre of our lives. It bypasses all the barriers and the false pretenses, cuts right through all the rubbish, and it majors on delivering truth. Sometimes it's truth that we love to hear, No, no, thank you. (laughs) Is that truth I need to hear, is it? (laughs) That was a major moment, mate, I'm not going to lie. So sometimes it's truth that we need to hear. (laughs) And at times it's truth that we find hard to hear. Either way, this truth is always acting for your good and to the glory of the one to whom the words belong. However, though again, there is some truth in this word that Peter is talking about, I still do not believe it primarily is is about the written word of God, which leaves us considering what Peter is then actually talking about. What I love about this letter from Peter is that it draws together all of his experience and understanding to produce what is actually rich in theology and steeped in great care for the local church. Peter might have been an uneducated guy, Acts 4, but he was one, or known as one, who had been with Jesus. And it is in his latter years, when he is writing to these church families, that he's pulling together all that he knows from his experience, from that which he's learned from what's been written in history, from that which he has learned from his brothers in Christ and with the help of the Holy Spirit. This is just how we grow. That's also how we grow and learn together in our journey with Jesus today, from experience, from biblical history, and from our brothers and sisters in Christ and a lot of help from God through his Holy Spirit. Even in these Verses from 22 to 25, we have influences and references that Peter uses. In verse 23, the language of perishable and imperishable is the same language that the Apostle Paul uses in his earlier and first letter written to the Corinthian church, 1 Corinthians 15, that is. In verse 24, the all flesh is like grass section is quoted from Isaiah 40. And then finally we have verse 23, the living and abiding word of God, which is the very similar language to to that which the Apostle John uses in this gospel. And the main reference points for those are John 1 and John 15. Now, I don't know if you've had any moments of clarity when things might have seemed a little bit fuzzy, but then everything becomes a little bit clear. You know, like when Neo sees beyond the binary code of the Matrix... Or when Lewis Lane suddenly realises that Clark Kent is Superman. Although, come on, Lewis. <laughs> come on. <clears throat> How is it that a pair of glasses 
and, and just a suit wrap up his disguise as Superman. Anyway, and what about the moment of the Roman soldier? You know, when Jesus breathed his last on the cross and suddenly the soldier has this moment of clarity. Truly, this man was the son of God. When Peter writes, I believe he's writing with a greater clarity. I believe this word that Peter is talking about is not so much the word spoken or the word written, but the word embodied. He is talking about the person of Jesus Christ. Three times in verses 23, funny enough, three times for Peter, it's three, three and Peter go quite well, don't they? <clears throat> three times denied, three times loved, three times the word is mentioned by Peter. Verse 23, the living and bi- abiding word of God. Verse 25, the word of the Lord remains forever. Verse 25, this word is the good news that was preached to you. So let's pitch Peter's letter like this. To the followers of Jesus Christ, church families scattered across the nation of Turkey, those living out a life for Jesus under Roman rule, to you was preached the person of Jesus Christ, the word of God, the good news. Picking up on verse 23, Peter writes, through the living and abiding word of God, this is how you and I were born again. This is how you and I received new life. The language that Peter uses stems from the same language that John uses in his gospel in the account of the life of Jesus. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. This word that John is speaking about is the person of Jesus Christ. And when Peter actually writes this in the Greek, he writes in the same, uh, the same word that John uses for word as well. So the word embodied. The one who is alive and in whom was life. And it's not just um, past tense, but present tense. He is the word who is living today. He's also the word that is abiding, okay? So that's, uh, Peter says that we are born again through the living and abiding word of God. In John 15, John records the words of Jesus himself that says, abide in me and I in you. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So through this word, this living and abiding person, you can be born again. Now, Peter's not trying to give us cryptic clues here. He's not trying to make life intentionally hard for us when we read the letter or for the original readers. He is just writing from an already formed position of clarity. Understanding this is important because it helps bring a fuller comprehension of the text and to what Peter is communicating. Because Jesus is alive today and abides in all of those who choose to abide in him, you are all born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable. It is through him that you've received this incredible inheritance. This is the shared hope that you and I have and the basis from which you should love one another earnestly as God's family. Moving on to verse 24 and 25, Peter quotes from Isaiah 40, starting with all flesh is like grass and ending on, but the word of the Lord remains forever. This section is practically summarising the difference between, as we talked about earlier, the enduring nature of God, the workmanship of his glory, versus the limit of time upon mankind and our inability to produce the glory in the same likeness of God. However, with that, Peter gets the privilege of reading this historical text from God through the lens of what he now understands about the person of Jesus Christ. That's a really helpful tool, by the way. For those of us who are followers of Jesus, that is how we are to read the Old Testament, through the lens of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. You don't have to look too hard in the New Testament to discover the forever sayings connected to Jesus. Hebrews 7, 17 17 and 22 to 24. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing office, but he holds the priesthood permanent because he continues forever. Hebrews 1 8, but of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Revelation eleven fifteen, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. 
1 Peter 1.25, but the word of the Lord remains forever. The embodied word of the Lord remains forever. And finally, finishing on the end of verse 25, and this word is the good news that was preached to you. And this embodied word, the person of Jesus Christ, is the good news that was preached to you. God's word is written, God's word is spoken, God's word is embodied through his son. He is the good news for all that would believe in him. That is the wonderful nature about who God is and how he operates. He is not one-dimensional. He is multifaceted like a diamond, which means when we look at love, it's not just a word. It's not just an action. It is also a person. 1 John 4, 8, God is love. The same goes for the word written, spoken, embodied. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God. As the worship team, I invite the worship team to come up. We're going to look to respond together as God's family. And in doing so, I'd like you to turn, to your, turn in your Bibles to John chapter 1. Let's stand together, shall we? So we're going to come into a place of worship and of response. We're going to open the door really to come in a position of thanksgiving to God. We're going to set our eyes on him, the author and perfecter of our faith. We're going to humbly bring ourselves to the one who is not just one dimensional, but multifaceted, word written, word spoken, word embodied. And we're going to invite God to come. I'm going to invite you, Lord God, just come in your presence. Come and minister in response to your word now, God, we ask. Father, would you cause words of encouragement, your voice really to just um, really burst out into this family environment, Lord. Even now, Father, would you do a work in our hearts, Father, would you transform us? And a minimum, Lord, God, we just want to go out different to the way that we came in. But thank you, God, that you, you are going to you offer and bring so much more. But Lord, we're just going to give our, set our sights on you as we read this scripture. From verse 10, John chapter 1, he was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the one only only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. I've got a a few prophetic contributions to bring, but I think uh, what I'd like us to do now is just come with a a responding song, bring our adoration to him, set our sights on the word that was from the beginning, set our sights on the one who has captured us and won us and to himself and uh, called us to be part of the family of his name, who has done with our our deeds of past, that of rejection of him and called us to be his own and given us a hope and a future. Lord Jesus, we want to give you the glory as your family. We want to bring glory to your name. And I pray you would stir the hearts of those people who are not yet part of your family. Stir their gaze towards you, I pray this morning, that they would come on bended knee before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords.
that they will yield themselves to you, knowing that all that they do in this life is temporary, but they'll save the one thing of giving their lives to you in exchange for something that is no longer perishable, but imperishable, to a, to a glory that does not fade. Lord, I, I want to thank you, Lord Jesus, for the hope you've given me in my life. I want to thank you for the future hope that I have in you. And I pray that, Father, uh, Lord, as a church family, we would be one that continuously remembers that again and again and again. It's our testimony, Lord, that you have won us to yourselves and given us a future. Father, we worship you. Lord Jesus, we worship you. Holy Spirit, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.